Hello everybody and welcome to my channel in history and guys and today I want to talk about the upcoming saga expansion Age of Chivalry. You might or might not have uh, listened to the activation phase podcast where they talk to one of the authors of this expansion and there for the first time for the general public they released the list of all the factions that will come with this expansion. And it's going to be a really big one with 12 factions overall, including the more famous ones like the English or the French and the Germans, but we will also see a Spanish faction, we will see Italians, and we will see a whole host of sub-factions to those factions uh, as well. And when we were talking about this expansion in the club, a lot of people were very enthused about it, but at the same time the question came up, which miniatures to pick actually for this period. And the period we are talking about is roughly the Hundred Years War to the uh, end of the uh, Wars of the Roses because one of the factions is uh, Burgundy and Burgundy under Charles the Bold basically stopped to exist as a individual state in 1480 or 1482 when his heiress uh, married uh, Maximilian uh, the later Emperor Maximilian, and um, after that it became basically a different kind of dynasty. And I feel this is also a pretty good cutoff because after that we get into the Landsknecht era, the Italian wars, and that already gives you an idea what miniatures to look for and which miniatures might be not quite as suited for the whole Age of Chivalry. Now of course there will be a lot of people who don't care too much about historical accuracy and that's fine and I feel especially it's fine when you are aware that things might not be lacquer perfect but still okay-ish. But on the other hand I think there are a lot of people who have no general idea what the arms and armor of the 12th century look like and what they look like in the 13th, 14th and 15th century. So after a short consideration I thought this might be a very good topic for a video and that's what I want to talk about today. Now before we get actually into the little presentation that I've prepared, I quickly want to talk about references. First of all, nowadays there are fantastic references, very well research uh, videos on YouTube. Um, I'm talking about people like uh, Dr. Tobias Capwell, for example, who used to be a creator of the Wallace collection. But there's lots of content really and I think if you just have a look at YouTube, you get already a lot of ideas, especially what later period armors look like, because they seem to be a little bit more popular uh, with reenactors and the likes. But then there are obviously other sources as well. The first one would be anything from Osprey regarding this period. This one is uh, European Medieval Tactics number two. There's an issue number one as well, but that covers the previous period, so uh, up to 1260, which would be too early for us. However, there are a couple of uh, paintings here, uh, drawings, there are a couple of armor pieces here as well and uh, it's a decent start. I would probably, if I wanted to pick something just for Age of Chivalry or for other people playing, other games you are playing in this period like Never Mind the Willhooks, I would probably pick something different. Something that is very much uh, suited for the period because it's actually also one of the armies that we will see in this expansion is this one. This is from the Xoikos Verlag. They do publish some of the stuff in English as well. And this is about the armies of the Hussites. This is the first volume uh, equipment, organization and um, use. And this is very nice because it's very much in the uh, style of Osprey books, but this obviously is regarding the Hussites. So anything uh, if you are planning to build a Hussite army, this is probably a very good start uh, to get into it. And uh, you will see like there are like drawings on, on this side, but also contemporary paintings that feature arms and armor, and uh, you get a very good idea what people were looking like in this period. And then the last thing that I want to uh, reference to uh, today is this one. This is definitely also available in English because the authors are, I think, a Belgian uh, husband and, and wife uh, combo. And this is called Historical Weapons and Armor, Knights and Langsknechts from the 8th to the 16th century. As far as I know, originally this was 
supposed to be two volumes. Uh, but uh, in the German, this German issue is combined into one uh, volume. And it's very, very detailed. So I will give you just one example where you can see what I mean with that. And let me just have a look. Now, for example, let's have a look at this table. You see there are different helmet types, different equipment types. And when you look at the description on the left side here, you see that they always give gates and give you a very accurate idea of what arms and armor look in every individual decade that they cover here. So this is a very good start if you just want to basically look at a miniature and see whether the equipment actually matches the period that you try to play in. So anything like this, and I think there are lots of online resources like I mentioned before, not just YouTube, but also um, in terms of essays and uh, hobby blogs and so on. So I just encourage you do some research maybe if you're interested in it, if you just want to play it and just follow the uh, presentation that I want to give now and you will probably have a very good idea what miniatures are suitable for the period and which ones are maybe a little bit off. Now let's get started. Okay and here we are. Um, as you see, again, the period is approximately 3050 to 1482. And I'm covering 28 millimeters only because, like I said, the main goal is to give an idea regarding age of chivalry. Uh, that's also why the period is like this. You could probably go a little bit earlier if you go really early, uh, 100 years war and the conflicts immediately before, and that would be still fine, I guess. Uh, but anyway, let's get started. So, first of all, a couple of remarks. Uh, the list is almost certainly not complete because there are so many smaller companies that are very obscure. I've never heard of them, especially when you are not living in the UK where you might see them on trade fairs and so on. But still, I hope I give a fairly complete picture. And honestly, if they are too obscure and too small, you might lack variety and compatibility as well. The next aspect is I don't have a 3D printer, so I'm not really into this whole 3D printing business too much. I know a couple of larger 3D printing design studios like Reconquer Designs and Macbury Miniatures, and they will be features here, featured here, but um, I can't cover all the smaller ones. And I'm not too knowledgeable about the civilian clothes. I try to refresh my knowledge regarding arms and armor a little bit. And uh, I do have some idea about regional specialities as well, like for example the Gorgengarks uh, or Gorgengarks uh, weapons like the Flemish cities used. But I might miss some aspects regarding civilian clothes. So this is not like a proper um, scholastic uh, approach, it's more like rule of thumb, so to speak. What do we know about this period? Well, first of all, we see a very fast progress of arms and armor. When you look at the very start of the period, you will see, still see a lot of visible chainmail or ringmail or whatever you might call it, uh, want to call it. So basically interlinked uh, pieces of steel protecting the body mostly against uh, sharp weapons. And, but they also offer obviously some level of protection against blunt weapons. Uh, you will also see that at the beginning of the period, uh, a lot of the armor is actually covered in caparisons when it comes to horses, and you also see tabaks on the armor. And especially with the upper level of society, this will start to disappear the more elaborate the armor becomes, when, because at a certain point the armor itself becomes a showpiece in some ways. Generally speaking, I would say rather try to aim a little bit too late, uh, too early than too late. So anything that really gets into the territory of the Italian wars, you quickly move into early 16th century stuff and that really looks a little bit off when you see the period because for example a lot of the lesser armed people or even the heavier armed people were running around in very wide slash uh, puffed clothing and that looks definitely not period appropriate I would say. So really keep that in mind. The next aspect keep in also in mind that like Age of Chivalry will not have a lot of gunpowder units. So you don't really need to do a lot of cannons and you also really don't need any kind of archibus or any kind of uh, shooting weapons except for if you go mercenaries. So or if you ha want to use a unit of mercenaries. 
if you are playing another rule set, um, having more gunpowder equipped uh, soldiers would be probably useful and sensible. That's not to say that you should not have, for example, crossbow and uh, archers. Uh, that's definitely still very period appropriate. Let's talk quickly about the factions uh, that we will see. Like I said before, the source is the activation for uh, phase podcast and that was straight from the horse's mouth. So we can be very sure that these are the factions that will be in the in the actual book. So those will be England, France, Brittany, which is the northwestern part of France, if you are not uh, familiar with it, Burgundy, which is uh, basically a kingdom or a duchy between Germany and France, uh, nesting into the Alps, so part of Switzerland as well. The Castilians, which they call Castilians because they want to uh, differentiate it from Spanish from uh, other ages, uh, other periods like uh, the Age of Crusades, but it's basically called, it's called Castilians, but you can play it as Aragonese or another faction from Spain as well. Then the Germans, uh, so the Holy Roman Empire basically, the Flemish cities, the Scots, the Hussites, the Italians, and the Italians will have a lot of sub-factions according to what they said. The Swiss and the Free Companies, or Escorchers, I think my French completely uh, missed that, but that's basically Free Companies that are not in an employ of anybody and who are kind of pillaging through the countryside until they find a new uh, employer. Some factions will have sub-factions, and there will be a couple of um, stuff that will be very typical for the Period. So there are the Gurgen Ducks, which are kind of pole arms that look like a, an overweight spear almost. Um, that is very typical for the Flemish uh, pole weapons of the period, and they were used to great effect in a couple of very well known battles, like the Battle of the Spurs, in, in uh, the two kind of battles of the Spurs, but one happened in, in, uh, in what is now known as Belgium, and uh, there the French knights got uh, pretty much their uh, bottom. Uh, spent by, by the Flemish uh, cities. Then we have the Swiss with the pikes, which is kind of logical because this is a sky of the period where the pike weapons come into play again in, in Europe. And the Swiss were pretty much one of the first uh, nations that employed them, except maybe for the Scots as well. We will see war wagons. And um, something that's also noticeable is you will certain see g certain different shield shapes, especially when it comes, for example, to the Hussites. Um, and also the shield shapes generally change, and the use of shields also changes, because at some point the people who were very heavily armored completely ditched the shield because their armor was all they needed for protection, and they rather went to heavier weapons, which is also one of the reasons why there's no heavy weapon rules in this um, period. So, because everybody has, is running around with them, and uh, that would basically mean that it becomes a norm. Okay, <clears throat> we will start with the plastic options, and the plastic options that comes to everybody's mind, and where I could basically stop the presentation probably after uh, after covering this option, are parry miniatures. Parry miniatures have two re really relevant ranges. One is this uh, Agincourt range, which is not the very early part of the 100 years war, but rather kind of the middle to the end. And they have a range for War of the Roses, so if you are trying to have something a little bit more modern looking, then and more heavily armored, more like plague armor looks, then go for the War of the Roses. Both have a lot of plastic boxes, um, and they offer a lot of interchangeable parts as well, so you can customize your hearts out here. Uh, you also have a lot of spare parts that you don't need, really need to use. There are some options from other manufacturers where you basically can buy a dolly, so body, and then just attach parry arms and, and hex. And they also have a, a complementary metal range. Uh, I will cover that later. So generally speaking, it's a very good range to start with. It might be also a very good uh, range to start and stop with. And generally with the Paris, you can always assume that they've done their research, so the equipment options will be very accurate, like I've shown here. The next option, or not option, is really Warlock Games. I'm covering it more because the question will inevitably come up. The problem with the Warlock Games range is the fact that they basically start uh, with the Landsknecht era, so the Italian wars. They do start right after 1480, but if you look at the miniatures, they are really like 
more trying to cover the whole Italian Wars period, and that goes really until 15, 20, 1530, I believe. And it does look very off if you compare it to the armies that you can build with the Paris, for example. So I would advise not to pick any Warlock games uh, stuff. And it's kind of telling that for the War of the Roses and Hundred Years War range, they actually have the Paris in their webshop. Make your own assumptions from that. The next option would be Fireforge games. They also have a large range of plastics. Most of the stuff is geared towards Age of Crusade, so up to 1250, maybe 1300. However, I feel that like maybe some of the infantry kicks might work in the very early part of the period we try to cover. Um, and especially the Almogavars, which is Spanish-like infantry, might be interesting depending on how the Spanish armies are going to set up in the, in the book. But generally I would also probably advise to avoid this range if you want to go plastic, go with the Paris, generally speaking. They do have uh, war wagons made of MGF um, in different scales, so be sure you pick the 28mm ones. They are pretty decent base to start off, uh, especially because you can glue all kinds of stuff on, on uh, MGF and uh, basically use it as a, as a base rather than scratch building it from, from the ground up. But there are other metal options as well. This one probably is though, one of the cheapest ones if you need war wagons. And you will need war wagons, I suspect, if you want to play the Hussites or the Flemish. You do have uh, Gripping Beast as well as a plastic manufacturer, but again, it's a very early range, it's more designed towards Dark Ages really, and that's like 500 years or even more too early. There is one very small exception, uh, they have like a 12 man pack of archers, but honestly even if you're not too thorough with the civilian clothes, it does look a bit off. And there are better options, so why pick Gripping Bees unless you have them lying around and just want to have a generic bunch of archers that you can use in other warbanks as well. Then we have Victrix Limited. At the moment, again it's too early, because the um, Norman range for example will be good for up to maybe 1150, depending on which helmets you use and if you're not looking too hard I suspect. So about first, second, maybe third crusade and then it tapers off really. They get preview um, medieval range. And uh, but I suspect, just looking from the extra preview pictures and also from what they've written in the preview, like it's still gonna be more like covering the middle of the crusade, so basically where their current range cuts off it will start, and that will be 1150, 1100 to 1300, maybe 1350. But since they are trying to build crusaders, Arabs and Byzantines, I suspect this is the range is also going to be too early, so I would also suggest not picking this range. Then we have VNV Miniatures. VNV Miniatures is a small Ukrainian manufacturer that is being sold through various distributors in Europe and in UK. They seem to specialize in Kusaga, so um, they have mostly packs of four units uh, each. Um, it the main material is resin, but they now offer also to make them in metal. So we will see how much the metal variations proliferate into into the distributors range. But you might also, or you are also able to uh, order them directly from them from Ukraine. And apparently, even uh, though there is a, obviously the war going on, they still seem to be very reliable with the deliveries, according to what I've heard. They do have a small medieval range, and since they seem to always keep an eye on what's happening in Saga. I wouldn't be surprised if we see more 100 years war stuff um, coming from them up to the release of the expansion which will be in the second half of the year. So keep an eye peeled for them because their miniatures are very lovely actually. And now we get really to the biggest uh, group of manufacturers and those are those one, the ones that are building or producing metal miniatures. And the first of all is para miniatures. I said a lot about them already. What you can just say about the metal range is it's basically the same style. It supplements the plastic range with characters, with guns, with wagons. Um, it just matches very well. You uh, have a lot of options and especially just be aware that if you are using the character models, they have a very 
expensive armor, so they're probably not even suited for Haskag or something like that. They're really figures for your for your Liga. One thing I want to point out is they do have a Karakshio um, in their range. The Karakshio is a um, kind of more ceremonial war wagon that the Italian cities uh, had in their armies. And it was really slow, it was pulled by oxen, and it, basically the idea was you are not supposed to lose the Karakshio because the Karakshio is so slow and so sluggish to move you can't run away from the battlefield because the whole army would be completely dishonored. And that's what happened quite a lot when the Italian city struggled against the uh, Holy Rome um, uh, Empire under Frederick Barbarossa, for example, and his three uh, successors. Now, we before I said that the Griffin Beast plastic range is not very useful. That is very true for the original Gripping Beast metal range as well. However, Gripping Beast recently, I think a year ago, also acquired the front rank range. And the front rank range looks very well suited for the period. The, it's a very large one. You do see a, some posing repeats, but that's very typical for metal ranges. And honestly, you have it with, with plastic kicks as well to a certain degree. Um, but it's very well suited. It, According to the pictures that I've seen on the internet, it also looks like it suits very, fits very well with a lot of the other metal ranges in terms of size and proportions. It's not like a super modern, hyper-realistic range, but I think it looks very nice as well, and it works very well with the Paris, for example, and also with some other ranges that I will talk about later. What's also interesting is they have a couple of pole weapons that are rather specific and not too, you can't find them too often. Um, and that can be very interesting if you want to, uh, for example, play Scots and you want to use some bargishes. They also have some wagons, um, but they are more for objectives. Uh, so if you um, if you if you want to build some mission objectives, not so much for actually war cards or war wagons. First core is interesting mostly because they have a specific range for Hussites. Um, you have to pick them like medieval range. Like they have like different ranges for different periods in, medi in the medieval time. And if I recall correctly, they also had mostly in an indication of periods the models are suited for. So that's generally true with a lot of manufacturers. Look closely at the homepage and see what they write actually about their own range. They have very nice war wagons and interesting shield packs as well. So if you want to customize your range and you plan on building um, a, metal, a metal army, this might be a very good uh, stop to fix at least some of the pieces, if not all of them. Claymore Cosking is also very well known, I think, for me uh, their medieval looks. Um, they have um, some interesting equipment ranges, they have the, uh, lot of, have some puppets here, uh, so these are these large uh, shields that the Italians, for example, use, and they, they were also sometimes used by soldiers with crossbows. And um, so it might be very suitable for Italians, for example, for Hussites. They do look very dynamic and the poses, I like them quite a bit, so Claymore casting would be another recommendation. And as far as I remember, they also match fairly well with the previously mentioned ranges. Now, let's get to Essex Miniatures. Essex Miniatures is, as you also know, probably very well-known manufacturer, mostly known for the 15 millimeters. It's a bit unclear for me when I look at the homepage whether the range is 25 millimeter or 28. Um, just from the looks, it looks like a very old school 25 millimeter range. Um, the range is, uh, part of the range that's relevant for us is Equitas of Burgundians, which looks fairly accurate. Um, should work for some of the higher, let's call them tech factions, like the French and the English and the Germans probably as well. Um, I'm not really sold on them. I think they are okay, but they are, given the amount of options, there are better options here. Um, the next one, and that is again very interesting, is the Wargames Foundry range. Um, Wargames Foundry was sculpted, at least this part of the range, uh, 100 years was in War of the Roses, was sculpted by the Perry Twins as well. So it's very much the same sculpting scu uh, as their own range uh, that they produced later on. It looks a little bit more old school, but I think if you put them even into the same unit, 
uh, I don't think you would really notice, as far as I can judge from the from the pictures. And the pictures on both sides are very, uh, the home pages are very nice because they are pancakes, so you get a much better idea what the miniatures look like. They also have some interesting civilians and uh, looters and so on, so you can build some scenarios or some vignettes out of them. I think this is a very nice option here as well. Then we have an Italian manufacturer, Merleton Miniatures, and here it's a very wild mix of stuff that looks like it has been out for a very long time, looks a bit sketchy in terms of details, although it's hard to say really because uh, you see basically the, uh, the bare miniatures without any paint, without any wash to show some uh, details. Um, generally the gates they give on the range looks fairly good. Uh, they do have a couple of very modern metal sculpts as well because I think they did a Kickstarter last year and that range looks actually very nice so it's definitely worth having a look and they do have some specific ranges for Scots and Spanish and a lot of civilian and accessories so it's a fairly large range it's a bit all over the place in terms of uh, age and uh, period and factions but it's not, nothing you should ignore if you are just keen on building something that looks a little bit more off the trunk path. Then we have Crusader miniatures, again very similar to Foundry, Frank and um, Perry. Um, it's not super big, it's fairly generic range, but it's not bad either, so you could pick some stuff up there as well if you want to build some variety, and I will get to that at the end of the presentation. We have also Black Tree design, um, they have a 100 years uh, war range, also looks fairly similar to Warren Foundry, Franklin and Perry, and I've seen actually some uh, photos, I think, on Lex Adventure uh, uh, forum where somebody basically ranks them up all in one unit and it looks super homogeneous, really. So it's also an option if you want to supplement your your army, and I think but I will talk to about combining them later a little bit. I think it's also an option if you want to build some armies for larger games. Range itself is rather medium sized, so it's yeah, what you can expect. Then we have irregular miniatures. They have, um, I'm not sure whether the home uh, she is actually right, I might have to correct that. Um, they have a rather big range, they have specific units for Hussites and war wagons, and they have also some of the um, some stuff for Spanish. Unfortunately, the home page is super old school looking, like early 90s or something like that and you don't have pictures from all for all the packs that they offer so you are really not always sure what you get you have to look what they uh, what they advertise everything for because that seems to be fairly accurate the other issue i see with this range is that it's not really i'm not really sure whether it's really true at 28 millimeter i suspect it's more like 25 looking at the proportion very old school, fairly simple. I think this is something you can combine with the Essex miniatures, for example. And then we have Castillo miniatures. It's, I think, also a small Italian company. They have a very small range, but it looks fairly modern. And it looks very well suited if you want to build a slightly different looking German warband or supplement uh, the Hussig warbands, especially with the heavier arm people. So this could be also an interesting option if you want to add some flavor to your warband. Another old school manufacturer is Lancashire and or Hinchcliffe miniatures. Uh, they have also very old school range, 25 millimeter. Um, I think that the age shows and uh, I understand that some people have a very nostalgic uh, feeling for them. But for me, I would say no, not really the best option. I would avoid this range. The, they also have some wagons for scenarios. Again, I think if you want to go the super old school range, then stick to the three, four companies that I, I mentioned in this presentation as having very old school, smaller ranges, like smaller in terms of the size of the miniatures. Then we have a uh, war games uh, design, also probably 25 millimeter range, um, but they look fairly detailed, so could be also an option if you want to go that route. Antigaluvian miniatures, again, is a very specific uh, manufacturer. They have like some horror, some fantasy stuff, but they also have a small 
ca uh, range of uh, miniatures for covering the British Isles, so Irish and Scots mostly, uh, also partially for the Bruce's War. And given that the Scots and the Irish probably look a little bit outdated when you put them right next to the um, to the French army, for example, that sports the latest and most showy gear um, in the same period, I think picking something from the Bruce's War, which is 1320 about, could still work um, if you're not squinting too high at the miniatures. And they do have the advantage that they do give your warband the specific Scottish, Irish look. And I think that's maybe worth sacrificing a little bit of historical accuracy for. Then there's also a, a range that I stumbled over and that's Steve Barber's miniatures. And they have a small range for 100 years war for the Flemish cities. Only a woman with, uh, or the only manufacturer that has proper Gurgen Ducks, so these pole weapons. And um, they look very nice as well, at least on the pictures. Uh, I have no idea how they match up in size. But um, if you want to have a very unique looking and fairly accurate Flemish city warband for this period, then I would definitely have a look at Steve Barber miniatures. Then uh, I just wanted to cover Fuxor miniatures very quickly because it's a very well-known manufacturer as well. Um, generally I think it's also way too early. So at least 100 years if not more. Uh, that's true for the classical Baron's War range as well as for the newer Ultramare range for example that is covering the Crusades. The later Welsh you might be able to sneak them into the into a warband that you built with the Antediluvians. I think. But um, it will be a bit off in terms of historical accuracy. It's more like if you, like I said before, again the decision to have something more, slightly more characterful and more unique, the suited for the warband that you're playing than historical accuracy. And then you have Skillfist manufacturers, uh, miniatures. Skillfist also generally has very nice looking miniatures, I think, uh, very, very detailed. Some Swiss. And they also have the aforementioned dollies to use with the periplastic arms and uh, heads. So basically what happens is you get the dollies or the, the bodies and then you just glue on the plastic stuff that you have on your sprues left uh, because you didn't have enough bodies on the peri sprues. Um, they're very nice. You also have to watch it out because they have um, also I think a later period for the Italian wars and that's like I said before too late. Um, it's also generally the very end, so it's pretty high tech in, in this setting, but I think it still works. And last but not least, uh, 3D printing, um, very quickly, Reconquer at the moment looks too early. I'm not sure whether they will advance. If they ever do 1350s, 1400 Spanish, I suspect it's going to be super accurate, super detailed, super good looking because the scalps like they, like the uh, sculpture does are generally very awesome. The other option would be Macbury miniatures. Um, they do have a Scottish War of Independence um, line. Same applies as to all the other manufacturers that like I mentioned before regarding the Scottish. It's a little bit early, but it's probably still workable especially because there is some stuff for 14th century. And if you're getting into the first half of the 14th century, the step to 1350, 1370 is not that big. One thing I completely forget, forgot in this presentation, and a huge apology to Martin Seven Sun for that, uh, he has a small Etsy web shop for uh, his, uh, his uh, line called Ragged Staff Miniatures. And there are a couple of miniatures for the um, War of the Roses. They are very characterful, they are sculpted by the same sculptor as the guy who runs Reconquer. And I will link it in the video description below um, so I can at least partially compensate for my failure here. So how do we proceed to build a war bank? Well, the first option is go very easy go, uh, and lazy and just get one, two, three boxes of periplastics depending on what kind of war bank you want to build really. Um, they do have partially for the, for the Argenco range, for example, they have English and French. Uh, boxes. Um, they have some boxes that just work for any faction at all and you might just want to maybe add some smaller features like different shaped shields, um, different weapons and um, 
you can customize like that. The next option is to get miniatures from one or multiple metal ranges, and I think combine front rank, parry, foundry, crusader, uh, black tree design should be should work very well. They are all fairly same size, fairly similar in terms of character and proportions. And you get the advantage that you mask that there are some duplicates because the more variety is, the less the duplicates really catch your eyes. If every second miniature looks like another, it's sometimes a bit obvious, I think. And then there's the option to pick a specialist um, range, basically. So, for example, Barber models for Flemish or build your Scottish War ones from Antediluvian and from Macbury, for example. That's an option. Just keep in mind, um, if you want to customize your warband, you need to, or if you want to build certain thing, aspects of your warband, you might have to do some customization. So, for example, I'm not aware of any proper pipe, pipe models, but that's fairly easy to solve by just removing the weapons and uh, getting some wire spears or brush spears of the uh, appropriate length and use that as pikes. Um, then different hacks is probably fairly easy to source and um, because there are so many plastic kicks and uh, like I said for example some of the um, kicks for from Fireforge have he uh, helmets that might be very suitable for this period as well because they were still in, in use sometimes like those iron hacks. Um, I'm not sure whether the proportions always match like something you have to probably try out. And uh, then the other aspect is, is um, shield shapes, which is fairly visible for, especially when you're using a lot of husk, uh, a lot of warriors and a lot of levies, probably because they would probably be the guys who will use more atypical shields. Sometimes the, the um, knights as well, if you go slightly earlier period. That's something either you can source from certain manufacturers because there are certain shield packs uh, available. Or you can scratch build them as well because I think there are a couple of pretty good decent instructions um, on YouTube how to build uh, shields and then just basically make a simple mold and copy them over and over again with green stuff. So, so that's it for the overview. I hope you enjoyed it and you got some information from it. I was wondering, are you going to start a warming for? Age of Chivalry, or are you playing the period already in another gaming system? Also, do you have any manufacturer that you think I missed and I should have mentioned? I will probably update the presentation that I have prepared, and I will also try to provide an um, upload for this so you can just download the presentation and just read through it uh, on your own. I personally look very much forward to it. I think it also should work hopefully for my personal hobby timing because I hope that I will be able to finish my Castle Genius by summer. And then I can just switch over to Age of Chivalry. Should be a lot of fun. And for me it's always great to hop into a new period and to explore the options there. I'm actually not sure what warbang I will pick though. Maybe I will just pick the drums or the hussites, or maybe both. We will see. You can never have enough warbands. Well, that's it for tonight. I hope you have a very good uh, time and uh, stay healthy and see you in the next one.